Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared, Has Been Hotel, Hell of a Boss, and Smiling Friends are all forms of entertainment for some. And entertainment is one of life's greatest desires. We're obsessed with it. We admire it. We work all week so we can have a little bit of it for a couple of days to then repeat the same cycle all over again. Unless you're unemployed. Then you just get it for free. Pity. Within the confines of life, we all find ways to entertain ourselves. It could be from sports, to video games, TV shows, movies. It could even be as simple as grabbing a rock and throwing it into the ocean. You could find entertainment from anything, really. And from the perspective of the entertainee, that isn't a word, but you understand what I'm talking about. You, yes, you have multiple choices to choose from when it comes to entertainment. But on the other side, you have the cogs and the machine that make everything run, and that's the entertainment industry, aka the mainstream. Gotta clarify that, because when you talk about about the mainstream media, everybody jumps to the conclusion that you're about to get political and start bashing news networks or a group of people. He made graduation, he made graduation, he made graduation. Yo. What's up? Hey Gabe, <laughs> wanna watch uh, <laughs> Blade Runner? Yeah, let's watch it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Wait. You were just gonna watch it raw? Have you lost your mind? Well, uh, why is it bad to watch it raw? <laughs> Cause you gotta use a VPN, dog. What VPN do I use? <laughs> well, you gotta use Surfshark VPN. So Surfshark is an app or browser extension that allows you to be anywhere in the world at any time digitally. And while you're going off the grid, you also don't have to lie awake at night wondering if you're vulnerable or exposed because you'll always be protected while doing this. Wait, so you're telling me this VPN will keep me secure from hackers on the public Wi-Fi while also keeping me safe in the encryption between a device and internet? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. I'm telling you right now that a VPN will keep you secure from hackers on public Wi-Fi while also keeping you safe from encryption between a device and the internet. Also, trust me, I know, Gabe. Trust me, I know, Gabe. Trust me, Gabe, Gabe. I know that you love, love, love smiling friends and don't hug me, I'm scared. But since you're American, you can't watch the funny British show that we're talking about today. So why don't you just change your location to where it's necessary and consume all the content you want in any region. You can do this other thing such as Netflix, HBO Max, or any stuff to watch anything, anywhere, all at once. All right, where do I get it? It's available for both PCs, Macs, Linux, Android, and iOS. They have 24 seven support that can help you at any time. And they won't collect your data no matter what. And there's also a 30 day money back guarantee. It's always important to feel safe on the internet, and while feeling safe, you could also have access to a ton of entertainment that you usually wouldn't have access to. Purchasing 24 months of Surfshark is seriously one of the best decisions you can make, and right now Surfshark is having a great offer of 3 months extra and 83% off. Just scan the QR code on screen or click the link in the description down below and use my promo code. Now, how about we use Surfshark VPN to watch Blade Runner 2049? The entertainment industry has existed since the dawn of time and has every avenue for every person. The movie business, theater business, music, sports, gaming. Adult. Has it been 30 seconds yet? I don't want to get demonetized. And within every industry, there's a pecking order and a line to follow in regards to advancing in whatever career you're pursuing. Also within every industry, there's nepotism and ways to cut corners, but not everybody knows a guy who knows a guy or could tap into their inner Saul Goodman. So most stories within the entertainment industry begin to blend. A common belief for people pursuing a career in acting is that you have to drop everything and move to Los Angeles and do some work so you can meet somebody and become the next big star. But what you get most of the times are people who take that gamble and get nothing and then give up on their dreams to fall into the backdrop of reality. Sorry to get grim there, but the thing about the mainstream media is that everything is very saturated and very competitive. And to get success within the mainstream, you often have to do a lot of work that isn't involved with traditional routes. You can attend a film studies lecture to then graduate and become a coffee boy for another three years to then settle doing a minor job in the industry. Or you could do the less traditional option and take risks by making connections and being creative so that you could have the opportunity to pitch yourself or a product with the hope to get lucky with a higher up in an industry. Jonathan Larson was a playwright for two famous musicals titled Rent and Tick Tick Boom, which was also the name of the movie about him where Andrew Garfield <laughs> played as him. <laughs> Jonathan Larson attended Adelphi University as an acting major, with a four-year scholarship where he got to star in multiple plays up until his graduation. And then after graduation, he worked at a rundown diner until he was 30 to survive while pursuing a career in theater with a screenplay for a musical called Superbia that he was developing for six years. Within those six years, he put tons of effort building connections, funding it, surviving in a shitty apartment to chase his dream, only for the project to then die after its pitch because nobody wanted to give it a chance. The story of Jonathan Larson is one of failure. He dedicated everything he 
had to a passion project for no one to see it because it couldn't be funded or platformed. What potentially could have gone down in history as a great theater project heavily inspired by George Orwell's 1984 will never be seen because no one was willing to give it a chance. And for Jonathan, this was six years of effort and passion down the drain when it was originally intended to be his big break. But Jonathan Larson didn't give up and once again he put his everything into another project called Rent that did find success and debuted it on Broadway on the 29th of April 1996. But the sad part is that Jonathan never got to see or bathe in the glory of his hard work and victory because he died on January 25th, 1996, a couple months before he debuted it on Broadway. Jonathan Larson was specifically a musical theater playwright, but stories like these are everywhere in the entertainment industry. If you wanted to make an album and have it be played on radio stations, you had to get it approved by a label that would fund it and if they weren't willing to take a chance on the project, it would oftentimes never be made. If you wanted to make a film or show, you had to make connections through college or go down the pecking order of the entertainment industry for years and years to then pitch the idea for it to most likely get declined. Breaking Bad is declined by multiple studios because none of them saw the potential in the project due to it having a protagonist that was a meth cook. And if Sony didn't finally budge, the project could have never been made and we wouldn't be talking about it to this day. Actually, the show was almost killed entirely. FX bought the script and changed their mind on making the show due to it being really mature and violent. And they could have shelved it so that no competitor networks could possibly make it, but they eventually sold it to AMC, so now we have it. The entertainment industry is one of skepticism and extreme risk. You could potentially fund the next big hit or fund a massive disappointment and lose a lot of money. And if you pass on something that is then a massive hit for another studio, you have to deal with that guilt forever. Everything is a gamble. And for the creatives pitching their passion project, it's also a dice roll on your project surviving to the next step or getting slaughtered to then try again until something works. You can make the best piece of art ever, but if you pitch it incorrectly, or a studio is too scared, it will never see the light of day. Well, that was until the age of the internet. The internet is one of the greatest innovations to happen within the last 100 years. Because of it, everything can be everywhere all at once, and it has been one of the greatest gateways to the mainstream media. What the internet did was create accessibility for young talent to express themselves, and get the same opportunity as somebody in an industry pecking order of bootlicking. Let's look at the music industry, for example where you once had to travel to a certain part of the world to make connections and grind for a chance to prove yourself to other artists above you, to then get another sliver of chance to pitch a project to a record label like Def Jam, to then have your fate be in their hands, you can now instead be like Juice World who made All Girls Are The Same on a homemade setup in his friend's room where he uploaded to SoundCloud for free, where he then did it again with his debut EP, 999, which had the song Lucid Dreams, where he also sat in his friend's room on a homemade setup to record it. This EP got him signed to Interscope Records. Lucid Dreams has 2,063,297,310 streams on Spotify as of scripting this video, and All Girls Are The Same has 1,112,031,426 streams on Spotify as of scripting this video. And here's a bunch of other artists that started by posting their music on SoundCloud and they all found success in the mainstream media. But let's now go to something that's more close to home and that's YouTube. Making YouTube videos, Twitch streaming, and drawing on Twitter can all make you money. But this video is about internet creators that broke into the mainstream via internet creation. So while it's cool that independent creators can make money by being independent, I want to focus on some of the most known and successful examples of people finding success by just being creative and expressing themselves without having to pander to a pecking order. So let's go in order and start with the first of the three examples. Don't hug me, I'm scared. On July 29th, 2011, a video was uploaded to YouTube titled, Don't hug me, I'm scared. This video would then proceed to get 71 million views and change the lives of the three creators forever. But let's go backwards and see how this happened. The three creators, Becky Sloan, Joe Pelling, and Baker Terry, all met studying art at Kingston University. Joe and Baker were majoring in animation and illustration, while Becky was majoring in fine arts. After graduating from uni, they all got a studio together, where they worked at day jobs that they all hated. And in between working these day jobs, they would make short films and art projects, and at some point they all wanted to do something involving puppets. With her fine arts experience, Becky began making puppets puppets and her first experiment eventually became what is now known as the yellow guy. And then soon after the three started to make a small set for the project that involved set puppets in a childlike environment. After this the trio began to make a song, similar to ones that you could find in kids learning shows. They wanted to present a song but with the twist of the short getting dark and violent at the end in a way to subvert expectations. The video stars a red guy, a yellow guy, a duck, and a notepad. The notepad is an inanimate object because Becky struggled to make a little girl puppet at the time. I'm assuming she learned since then given the, the show. The set looks like something that could resemble the legacy of Jim Henson's creations, like the Muppets, Fraggle Rock, or Sesame Street, mixing puppets and animation together. In the short, the notepad sings a song about creativity until it all goes left field, and they start playing with meats, hearts, and more meats as they dance and drag meat everywhere while there's blood and 
more meat. I don't know, they like meat, I guess. This video was made over the course of a weekend and was very chaotic. It was shot under a railway arch posing as a studio and one of the cheap lights that they bought off eBay was set up incorrectly and began to melt the roof of the studio. So the fire department had to be called to the scene where they were surprised by a bunch of raw meat and scattered blood on a set that looks like a children's program. But if you were in the shoes of these three, then congrats, you did it. You went through the journey of uni, enhancing your talents, and now you just made a short film all by yourself, full of animation and puppeteering while working a job you hated to survive. Do you take it to short film festivals to then use it as a pitch for something else? But wait, how do you even get there? How do you even show anyone what you just made to get more opportunities because of it? Now we're caught up from where we started. The independent short film made in a weekend by three people got 71 million views. It went extremely viral. I'm pretty sure most of you watching this can remember when it first came out. There were tons of reaction videos, including the fine bros, before they fell off the face of the earth. <laughs> Pity. A year after the YouTube video, the short appeared at the 2012 Sundance Film Festival as the shortest film that Sundance ever endorsed. And from there, it won many more accolades. It won Best Short Film at the Leeds International Film Festival. It got an honorable mention at the Philadelphia Film Festival for Best Original Song and won the SXSW Grand Jury Award. Before this, the creators discussed making the original short into a full series, but then decided that it wasn't possible since it had to be made by them independently with no budget. So it would have been extremely difficult and take like three years. But after the YouTube success and Sundance hype, they decided to go back to the idea, and a UK broadcasting station named Channel 4 had a program called Random Acts that was focused on funding short films, animation, and music videos for artistic talent in the UK. Channel 4's Random Acts commissioned a second episode of Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared in 2013, and for that episode, they partnered with a production company named Blink Industries, which helped them push the quality of Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared by not being solely DIY anymore. For example, they got proper studio space for the episode, which was an upgrade from the original, which was made in an apartment with cheap lights off eBay that lit the roof on fire. The second video titled Time got 45 million views. And after that video, the trio made the decision to make Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared into a full series independently. But to do this, they needed crowdfunding, so they made a Kickstarter. They uploaded a YouTube video where the three main characters are tied down as hostages while the red guy pitches the Kickstarter. The goal of the Kickstarter was to raise 96,000 pounds so that 24,000 pounds could be spent on each of the four individual episodes. And the Kickstarter was very successful, raising over 100 grand for the web series, and episodes 4 through 6 were able to go through production and were uploaded to YouTube from the span of late 2014 to early 2016. 30 million views, 33 million views, 24 million views, and 26 million views. The whole series was a complete success, dominating the internet every time a new episode was released, creating heaps of conversation, fan oh, theories, and external that. viewership from people making content about the show, or speculating the themes and easter eggs. The internet allowed these three friends to make something impactful in YouTube culture, and they did it mostly independently with little assistance and no strings attached. And for the next step going forward, they wanted to break into the mainstream media. On September 14th, 2018, a video was uploaded to the Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared YouTube channel titled Wakey Wakey. It quickly went number one on trending, and it was revealed that the episode was a teaser to the Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared television series. In 2016, the show was picked up for a pilot episode by Conan O'Brien's production film, Konako, alongside TBS's Super Deluxe Studios, which relaunched in 2015. And to help once again, Blink Industries were on board to make the pilot Wakey Wakey wakey. The premise of the show was that the three friends own a house in a place called Clay Hill, and the show was inspired by projects like South Park. It featured animation, puppets, and a bunch of new wacky fun characters. The pilot was completed and debuted at Sundance 2019 for people to watch for the first time, but given that the show didn't release until 2022, you can make the connection that things didn't go to plan. The creators got cold feet with the project and ended up scrapping the series after Super Deluxe Studios eventually went under, so the pilot was vaulted. It most likely got turned into a tax write-off. You ain't slick, Conan. Even though the show was never made, the miniseries still gave the creators an impressive portfolio, so they still did work within the mainstream. When the series first found success in 2011 and then 2012 through Sundance, Becky and Joseph made a music video for Tame Impala, and in 2013 they made a music video for Unknown Mortal Orchestra, where the character does some naughty stuff. But with the miniseries wrapped and Wakey Wakey going nowhere, they worked for Cartoon Network's Amazing World of Gumball. They worked on Gumball's season 5 finale, The Puppets, which aired on Cartoon Network on the 6th of October 2017, and it's one of my favorite episodes of The Amazing World of Gumball. It has the same amount of creativity and passion that you could find from the Don't Hug Me I'm Scared web series, but with the original characters from The Amazing World of Gumball episode having a mix of fine arts and animation. It even has an original song segment voiced by the same trio. But then everything came to a massive halt for not just the trio, but for everybody in the world. And that was due to the COVID-19 pandemic. 
During quarantine, it seemed that everybody had two ways of dealing with isolation, and that was to get consumed by boredom, getting lost as the days began to bleed into each other to the point where you couldn't tell the difference between a Friday or a Monday. A new series was written during the pandemic over Zoom calls, and the pandemic was weirdly helpful toward their writing, letting the creators get back to the roots of what they wanted with the original series. When the miniseries first found success, the trio ran into problems in regards to getting a good broadcaster to adapt the show to a TV-style format. If they had interest in picking up the show, there was usually strings attached, but eventually they found the right fit, and that was with Channel 4 once again. The team already had good history with the network, since the Random Max division funded the web series' second episode, Time. Channel 4 understood the philosophy of what they wanted, they wanted the show to get bigger in ambition and quality, but still remain small and claustrophobic like the original series. On June 19th, 2022, a video titled Fly was uploaded to the YouTube channel revealing that a show was coming exclusively to Channel 4 in September. Then the Queen died. <laughs> Pack watch. So they released another teaser to announce the show was coming out late September. The show released on the 23rd of September for streaming and was broadcasted through the network for television on the 30th of September. And the show was amazing. Each episode is around 24 minutes long. For reference, the entire Don't Hug Me I'm Scared miniseries put together is a total of 34 minutes. Going from 34 minutes to 144 minutes is a big jump, which meant there was a lot more content in the show in comparison to the miniseries, with a larger budget and creative freedom, so it's a no-brainer that the show was as good as it is. It improved everything that was done in the miniseries. The characters are more fleshed out, there's actual plots, multiple changing of sets, everything was a step up. It's a massive upgrade from the web series, where the teacher sang a song and something went south within the six minute runtime. The TV show format is a much stronger format. It lets the premise be more creative and ambitious. And if you haven't seen it yet, please watch it. It's really good. And it's even more impressive when you look at where it originally came from. The show exists because of the internet. Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared wouldn't exist if it didn't blow up on YouTube. The web series wouldn't exist if it didn't get crowdfunded through Kickstarter. Which means that the Channel 4 series wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the internet allowing a couple of creative friends to make something over the span of a weekend. To then share it to millions of people who are not only impacted the creators' lives, but the viewers as well. The pilot for Has Been Hotel was uploaded to YouTube on October 28th, 2019, and currently sits at 82 million views. The pilot for Hell of a Boss is uploaded to YouTube on November 25th, 2019, and currently sits at 52 million views, with episodes still releasing as a self-funded project. Some might see these two projects as amazing, intricate works of imagination, while others might see them as pure cringe, enjoyed solely by degenerates. But something that's undeniable is how impressive it is that these two projects were thought into existence by one person who's been working on the world building and characters for them even before elementary school. Following the theme of this video, Has Been Hotel and Hell of a Boss are created independently until one of them got picked up by a mainstream studio, which in this case was Has Been Hotel by A24 to release under A24 Studios in the future. And for Hell of a Boss, like I said, fan-funded episodes are still releasing on YouTube. And by a glance at the view count, it's very very successful. All the passion, hate, loyalty, and praise around these two projects is because of one person who decided to bring these projects to life. And that person was Vivian Marie Medrano, who was well known on the internet as Vivzy Pop. Vivian began drawing and making her worlds from a young age like most creatives who decide to pursue further in arts. Her first solid project was a webcomic about a mystical land ran by animals and anthropomorphic creatures titled Zoophobia. She started the project from the beginning of middle school to the end of high school, but when she got to college is where she began to really invest time into the Zoophobia webcomic for public viewing. She made a website to host the webcomic, but as the webcomic got more popular, the more bandwidth Vivian needed to invest to keep the website up to host it. And assuming most of you watching are special little snowflakes in college pursuing your dream, you understand that when you're a student, money starts to get low. Oh, hell no! So she unplugged the site and moved the comic to Tumblr. And at some point, Tumblr had a massive purge of content, and sadly, Zoophobia was the victim to this purge. Vivian still has the Zoophobia pages archived on a hard drive collecting dust somewhere, but she eventually ventured out to new stuff and began to move forward from Zoophobia. It wasn't gone forever, though, it was just shelved. In the future, a short was made for Zoophobia on September 30th, 2020, but Vivian has commented since that she didn't like the outcome of the project and has once again shelved it until further notice. But she also states that some characters from both Has Been Hotel and Hell of a Boss originated in the world of Zoophobia and were yanked out to be original characters in the world that they currently are in now. So the time spent on the world of Zoophobia wasn't a waste of time at all, since a lot of it would be recontextualized later. But as I stated earlier, Vivian was in college, specifically SVA, which is the School of Visual Arts in New York City. And in college, she would mostly work 
work on Zoophobia, but as she was heading toward graduation, she had to begin work on her thesis. Originally, she wanted to be really ambitious and have her thesis be a full-on animated musical, but that wasn't really realistic since she didn't have the connections or the resources that she has now. So she lowered her ambition, but kept some of the same principles. The project was named Timber. It was a musical with no dialogue, and it was her first time outsourcing help to work on a project. It was actually uploaded to YouTube in 2014, and it's still public if you want to watch it for yourself. While the short was challenging for Vivian, she wanted to outdo herself. After graduation, she wanted to make a more ambitious project than Timber, which would be a musical with dialogue and vocal performances. So to dip her toe in the water, she practiced animation around vocal performances by making an animated short to her favorite song. And while it was for fun, it led her to her first big bang on the internet. On October 30th, 2014, she uploaded a fan animated music video to Kesha's song, Die Young. Once again, opinions aside of how you feel about it, it has 73 million views and was her first intended original video online that wasn't re-uploads of school projects. Yeah, it went viral. It's actually a very similar story to the origins of Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared. Get talent and small connections through education, apply it to the internet, and get opportunities through that work on the internet. And the short did legit change her life. Through it blowing up, she began to meet a bunch of up and coming new grand artists where she then got invited to be on a panel with them. And some of these new grand artists are people I'll be talking about in a little bit since some are involved with Sleepy Cabin or Oni Plays. So I'll save that for the Smiling Friends part. Back on topic though, the short was her introduction to indie animation. And in the space, she began to feel accepted for her talents and made some of the best friends that she still has today. So with the community and a new sense of passion, she chose to pursue YouTube as a career. And because of the success of the Die Young video, she started getting animation commissions as well as other opportunities. But through these opportunities, she also suffered from reality checks and growing pains. To anyone who is a digital artist or in transition to becoming one, at some point you're gonna get scammed or taken advantage of. It happens to everybody in every field. And through it, you learn to never let it happen again. Vivian was not excluded from this. At some point, she made a four minute music video for a month and a half and was never paid for it. And when she wasn't flat out scammed, she did work for very cheap, which led to wasted energy that could have been put elsewhere. But then Vivian eventually moved to Los Angeles, California to live with some of the friends that she met through Indie Animation. And for her first two years in LA, she was doing a bunch of animation tests for different companies and projects. She would put a lot of energy and time into pitches and boards to find out that some of them were only formality tests, which means an animation team already picked out who they needed, but just had people doing it for formality. So a lot of the tests were for nothing since she wasn't getting paid for them. And it doesn't get better from here either. So let's go back in time a little bit before Vivian moved to Los Angeles. A minute ago, we talked about how Vivian wanted to make a musical with vocal performances and Broadway talent after her college thesis project, Timber. She already had some experience running a team because of Timber and Die Young, since she hired outside help for animation. So to start this project, Vivian met someone who claimed to be a producer that wanted to help her with her short. So she entered an agreement with his company where they did nothing over the course of a year and milked her out of $20,000. Vivian wasn't the person she is today. This was all her savings. It, it wasn't even an investment because nothing came out of it. And because of the scam, she could no longer afford to make this musical, so it got shelved. And that project is still shelved today because of the success of Vivian's other projects and heavy workload. Yeah, you know, we'll, we'll get to that. Vivian was naive because she was new to everything was learning as she went and the situation was a big low blow to her drive and spirit and she just had to accept that it was a learning lesson that was tough to swallow so to cope with her being robbed out of her savings and years worth of time she went back to square one and restarted a new original project with old characters she previously made and that project was has been hotel so now we're caught up to present time she began writing the pilot for has been hotel and during this time is when she moved to la and did the freelance stuff we talked about earlier has been was in a very early stage but she got to take her time and make it the way she wanted since vivian was okay financially financially due to her saving money as well as doing freelance work on the side. But after two years of being in LA, she stopped doing freelance work and chose to instead work full time on the pilot of Hasman Hotel. She started her own production team named Spindle Horse and went full steam on the pilot of Hasman Hotel. The pilot was completely independent, but had a lot of people with industry experience help make it. Vivian stated that she wanted Hasman Hotel to be a full series, which meant multiple 30 minute long episodes. So her plan was to pitch the show to multiple networks and see who would want to pick it up. And if worse came to worse, she would start a Kickstarter and continue the project independently. But after two years, the pilot was released and received high amount of praise. Even if it wasn't to everyone's liking, the project was extremely ambitious and it was also extremely important to the world of indie animation. If Hasman Hotel was to get a mainstream studio to release the series, that would be revolutionary for online animators. Vivian received many offers and chose to go with one of the best studios that anybody would want, 
which is A24. I've made a video on some of A24's horror films. I love the studio, but to give a brief explanation, A24 is a studio that allows a ton of creative freedom. So much so that it's made some of the catalog extremely weird and graphic, either it'd be over sexualization or just straight up weird imagery. And it could turn off some, but it's just, it's creative expression. A24 has funded amazing indie pieces from horror to drama, introspective to feel good films and shows. Hasbin Hotel will be the first animated project under A24. And given that A24 has built a reputation by giving artists creative expression and freedom, it makes total sense that they would take the gamble of having their first independent show be from somebody who came from the online world. Hasbin Hotel is not a corporate soul-sucking show. The pilot proved that. If someone was so passionate and dedicated to a project that they would put their own blood, sweat, and money to a pilot that had no guarantee of getting picked up, it shows that this isn't just another animation cash grab, but instead a passion project. And why would anybody logically let their baby just sit and die in the rain? As of right now, Hasbin Hotel is in development for an entire season under A24. And Vivian's new animation team, Spindle Horse, is now working with a larger veteran studio named Bento Box that has worked on projects under Michael Cusack, including him and Zach Hale's show Smiling Friends, which I'm going to be talking about in a minute. And if you look at the recent updates and sneak peeks on the Hasbun Hotel Twitter, you can see that the animation has improved drastically since the pilot. Collabing the spindle horse art style with the bento box quality control, it looks good. But since Hasbun Hotel is also now an official project, it's behind closed doors and NDAs, which means only slivers of info are released at a time about what is happening. So to combat this, Vivian made a show in the same universe that is completely independent and fan-funded through the old Hasbun Patreon titled Hell of a Boss. The story of Michael and Z The story of Michael. Oh my Want to eat any louder? The story of Michael and Zach are different from the two previous stories I discussed thus far. Michael Cusack and Zach Hader are the only two people in this video that didn't pursue a higher education after high school. They both can Hey. They both came up on the internet, and through said internet, they both made connections in the mainstream industry, which eventually led to their collaborative show on Adult Swim named Smiling Friends. Along with Michael's two other shows, Yolo Crystal Fantasy and the newly released Hulu exclusive Koala Man. But let's start with Zach first. Zach Hadel, also known on the internet as Psychic Pebbles, began his animation journey on the website Newgrounds in 2008. I'm going to tell you the true story of two of it. This is for you, Charlie. Okay, you ready? Okay, here we go. And like many other Newgrounds artists at the time, he made a YouTube channel to host his animations. And it was from YouTube that he found a majority success. And through that YouTube channel, Zach would start to accumulate a fan base from his edgy, exaggerated animations on current trends. Much like what you'd see in the current day on a channel like Meat Canyon. For example, a day after the death of Osama bin Laden, Zach would make an animation of a literal Navy SEAL <laughs> killing him. <laughs> yeah, okay, you, you get what I'm saying. But then he made a video that blew up, which got the ball rolling. And if you paid attention to what I've been saying this whole video, then you understand that everything begins with the Big Bang. And for Zach, it was an animation about the video game Skyrim. If you're not 12 years old, you might remember an internet meme from early YouTube about an NPC that took an arrow to the knee. I used to be an adventurer like you. And I took an arrow in the knee. It's old, and if you hear anyone recite it today, they're most likely a Discord goblin or someone who shouldn't be near children. But back in the day, people found humor like this hysterical. So Zach made an animation around the meme, and it blew up and got him hundreds of thousands of subscribers. <laughs> And with the newfound success, Zach continued to make animations on his YouTube channel while also making tons of connections. And then he decided to use that momentum to take a crack at the mainstream media. Through Zach's journey, he met many other people in indie animation who were just like him, making weird grotesque videos in their bedroom, and one of those people ended up being Chris O'Neill, aka ONENG. For the sake of length and presentation in this video, I chose three main subjects. And Zach's current partner is not Chris, but I should talk about him for a second since he also has a project coming out soon. During the run on Newgrounds animated shorts, Chris is one of the largest channels. He was even larger than Zack. Chris was on a hot streak of luck. Leo and Satan, Harry Potter shorts, and many other shorts were exploding. Zack and Chris were good friends that would help each other out with a lot of animations, either it'd be voiceovers or assisting with animation itself. And they had a lot of common since they both had newfound YouTube success, and they related to a lot of their upbringings. You did it, Zack. Yo, cut Oh, you idiot! So they came together and made a collaborative show titled Hellbenders, which followed the two main characters named after themselves, Chris and Zach doing weird little miscellaneous tasks every episode, like something you'd see in Spongebob, but with the adult twist of gore and randomness. The three animated shorts were put on Zach's channel and saw success quickly, and through that success, they started to pitch the show around until it got the attention of Adult Swim. I'm moving to America to work on Hellbenders for three years. 
So they ordered a pilot from the duo on an extremely tight budget of $20,000. That might seem like a lot of money to some, but animation is very expensive. For reference, the pilot for Family Guy costed $50,000 for 15 minutes. Later I'll reveal what it cost today to make an episode, but yeah, at the time animation was around $10,000 per minute. So now with a $20,000 budget, Zack and Chris alongside help from some friends had to animate 15 minutes with a budget of 2 minutes. It was a difficult task that never saw completion, because while in development it was scrapped by Adult Swim since they turned down Hellbenders altogether. They turned the project down before its pilot because of the name and premise. Adult Swim already accepted two pilots for two different shows, those being Your Pretty Face is Going to Hell and Mr. Pickles, and they didn't want another show related to Hell on their network. And because of this, Chris and Zack scrapped Hellbenders. The pilot could be publicly seen now due to Zack's network at some point getting hacked, and a bunch of unlisted and private videos were made public, and the pilot for Hellbenders was one of them. You can find it on YouTube and watch the completed project for yourself if you like. Hellbenders wasn't a useless journey though. Through the failure of the project, Chris and Zack both made a lot of connections at Adult Swim, and later Zack saw success at Adult Swim, so it was just another part of the journey. And for Chris, he's now currently working on his own video game, Boblo The Quest for Bing Bing. I know that sounds extremely racist, but it's a game coming soon made by Chris. And while we don't know if the game is going to be a success or failure as of now, at least he's making strides. After Hellbenders, Zack would continue to grow his brand. Sleepy Cabin was formed alongside Oni Plays by Chris, and both elevated Zack's status. Lyle, wake up! You gotta wake up, please! Lyle, Lyle, turn on the TV! They hit the Pentagon! They hit the fucking Pentagon! <laughs> he also then started to work on projects with John Tron, who at the time was also on a hot streak. From 2012 to 2014, the animation was at a peak for these new grounds people. And while everybody was bathing in the glory, someone was watching from the sidelines wanting to get in. Enter Michael Cusack. Michael Cusack is someone who is very overlooked. To even find out information about him requires wanting to seek it out specifically. Whereas with Zack, you could find bits and pieces about him all over the internet due to his popularity. So let's talk about Michael's journey. Michael started his journey at the age of 19. He didn't care about making animations yet because at the time he wanted to be a filmmaker. He grew up loving cinema and adored filmmakers like Sam Raimi, Robert Rodriguez, and Quentin Tarantino due to their get it done nature. Michael despised the idea of film school and looked up to ambitious creatives that built their careers by simply starting while learning as they went. At the time, Michael was also extremely broke and had nothing on his portfolio besides old YouTube videos. So he saved up money while working at Subway and got a loan for the bank for 15 grand to make a short film titled All Night Gaming. And the short took a long time to make. They shot 80% of the film in 2011, but Michael ran out of money and had to revisit it years later. So it released in 2014. The short sucked. It, it was his first project and it was very homemade, but that's expected since he was new. After this, Michael was 21 and had to get a dishwashing job to make up the money that he spent on the short film, working 11 hour shifts at one point for 14 days straight. During this time, he saw a colleague of his named Sam Hunter make and upload an animated short to Vimeo named Hot Dog Hustle. The short got 50,000 views and Michael got inspired. He saw that you could make outlandish projects that didn't require a lot of money since you could just animate the cast and crew that you would normally pay for on a live action set. Michael also saw animators like Eagle Raptor, Oni NG, and Psychic Pebbles exploding. And being a fan of them, he questioned why couldn't he be doing the exact same thing. So he taught himself how to use Adobe Flash and made his first animation titled Gabe Newell at E3. And it did well, which encouraged him to keep at it. He then eventually made his second bang, which was a short named YOLO. While he wasn't seeing the views that these new ground guys were getting, he was still getting millions of views regardless. Then on February 11th, 2014, Michael had his biggest bang yet. He uploaded the first episode to a new series named Demo and Darren, titled Siggy Butt Brain. And as of right now, that short almost has 10 million views. Through that, Michael started to catch traction in Australian animation, and was commissioned to make a Demo and Darren short for ABC. So he had the two characters interact with another character named Koala Man, which would later get his own show. Also through Demo and Darren is when Michael started to make connections with Adult Swim. When Justin Roiland wasn't beating his girlfriend or talking to fans, he would keep tabs on small animators, and became a fan of Demo and Darren when Siggy Butt Brain popped off. And Justin had an idea for an April Fool's spoof. He wanted Michael to make a bootleg Australian Rick and Morty adventure for Adult Swim to debut alongside Season 3 of Rick and Morty on April Fool's Day in 2018. Michael at first was intimidated and scared. It was a massive opportunity that would be seen by a lot of people and could make or break his career going forward in the entertainment industry. But all went well. It was an amazing parody and Adult Swim loved it. They loved it so much that they wanted him to make a whole show around it with the same style but original characters. So Michael used the characters that he already had from the YOLO short, thus began the making of YOLO Crystal Fantasy. All this happened because Michael got spotted by Justin Roilin, the creator of the most successful Adult Swim show, Rick and Morty, from his Demo and Darren series and made such a good impression with his Adult Swim short that he got his own show. Michael was now making valuable connections in Australian media as well as Adult Swim. For most, this is already enough for a success story, but it continues from here. After Bush World, Michael began to talk to someone he was once a fan of. Zack Hadel. 
After establishing friendship and having a lot in common, history began to repeat itself and Zack wanted another crack at the mainstream. At some point, YouTube changed their monetization system to favor watch time over view count and this pretty much killed animation on YouTube. Animators could no longer make a living off of animated shorts due to the favor of watch time and this began to affect the mindset of Zack. A year before Bushworld in 2017, Zack would make his most popular YouTube video, Get Out of My Car, based around a trending video. And the video went extremely viral, getting almost 60 million views. And Zack only made around $2,000 in total from it. Whereas before the change, he could have potentially got over 40 grand or even more. Zack would look at the landscape and see video game based channels like Markiplier, Smash. P. Martin and Corey Kenshin pump out long Let's Play videos, frequently alongside commentary channels like Leafy, Pyrocynical, and way more. They were making simple, easy videos with a lot of gain, while animators would put months into two-minute shorts with no gain. He began to feel demotivated with YouTube and found more joy being in other side projects like Oni Plays, Podcasts, JonTron videos, and many other things. He still liked animation but felt trapped and felt that the only way to use his full potential would be having a long project that he could be passionate about. Michael knew about the failure of Hellbent and he knew the potential of Zack. He was much bigger in status, worked on a storyboard episode of Spongebob, he had Michael Cusack who was huge in Australian cartoons and just got his own show on Adult Swim. Michael had studio experience and connections, but he also had talent. Not as much as Zack, but enough to the point that when they put their heads together they blend really well. So they came up with the concept and got really high at their agent's apartment and wrote the pilot for Smiling Friends. The pilot was greenlit and Studio Yada was brought to help with the animation. Studio Yada is an animation studio that is co-owned by Joshua Tomar, who was a new ground artist and friend of both Zack and Michael featuring a lot on Oni Plays. His wife is also a 2D animator for the studio, so that was a connection that paid off. The pilot of Smiling Friends adapted YouTube humor in a mainstream format. They even used a lot of YouTube connections for the show. The character Desmond was voiced by Mike from Red Letter Media. The guy on the wall was voiced by Finn Wolfhard, who was a fan of Zack even appearing on his podcast at some point. Even Oni NG made the outro song. It was like a big collaboration project because everybody wanted to see the project win. It was important for the show to get picked up. The pilot was made public by Adult Swim on April 1st, 2020, alongside Mike Michael's show Yellow Crystal Fantasy, and Smiling Friends did so well that it got picked up for a full season. So what was the budget for Smiling Friends? The whole season costs around $2 million. I know that seems like a lot, but earlier I teased something about Family Guy. The cost of one episode of Family Guy is $2 million. A whole season of Smiling Friends had the budget of one Family Guy episode. But an episode of Family Guy doesn't cost $2 million. Zack has complained a lot about how the animation industry will find every way to not pay animators. But since Zack and Michael are used to short form with little pay, a small budget wasn't a make or break. Instead of unnecessary meetings, they worked on Discord. Instead of outsourcing a ton, Zack used his previous internet connections and Michael used his as well. Princess Bento Studio under Bento Box, the same studio that's working on Hasbun Hotel, assisted in animating Yellow Crystal Fantasy and Koala Man. So with the Michael connection, they worked on Smiling Friends. And like I said for Hasbun, Bento is good at polishing the art styles of other people. ONENG once again helped by providing 3D models like 3D Squilton and The Devil. They also had a lot of friends do voice work. Michael and Zack did a bunch of voice work themselves. The small budget didn't matter. These two have always been DIY. So for the last 35 minutes, I just been in your face giving you the origins of these three projects at rapid pace. And now you know about these showrunners and their humble beginnings. But this isn't a video about the show's plots, flaws, or whatever opinions I or you might have. The reason I made this video is because I find this stuff really important. While all the journeys here have different origins and different reasons of why they did stuff, the one thing they all have in common is that they all did something. They carved a path for themselves on the internet and they all seen mainstream success. And that's important because at one point online creation wasn't taken seriously at all. Everyone can be creative and the best thing you could do to start your journey is just simply start your journey. Even if you only have a phone or some type of mobile device, that's something. Just do something. Make experiences. Be cringy because all of it starts to stack up over time. And you will start to see your art improve alongside you. There's a lot of independent online talent, but I chose these three specifically because they are now seeing success and all they had to do was just be persistent and believe in themselves. And that's why online creation is important. You shouldn't have to be required to go to art school, film school, or have all around nepotism to succeed. You should just be able to be yourself somewhere and get opportunities because of it. But something else that these people had in common was that they all failed but got back up. It sounds corny, but failure is always a part of the process. And you just have to get up and try again. With that though, I'm Dr. Skipper. Hey, you know, subscribe. It's free. Be creative, people. I'll see you soon. I'm gonna go get a coffee. No offense, loneliness is a new to me. With that miss, this is not the murder mystery. McDonald's, I was broke in paradise. I spoke a person when she said the price. Got me right to master basics in my extra life. Rappers turn
the boys, boy, better turn it into saga.